Welcome to CSTA 2016 San Diego and welcome to the session on Applied Math with Computational Thinking. Hi, I'm Pierre Bier and no, we're not in San Diego anymore, but with the help of the internet I'm going to recreate for you the presentation I made on July 11th, 2016 on Algorithmic Geometry. So what is Algorithmic Geometry? I like to think of it as a 21st century approach to spatial math, where we're synergize, synergizing the math with computation. And we use aspects of both traditions. So for instance, on the math side, we'll use a lot of sketching and uh, formal concepts. And on the computational side, uh, we'll be doing a lot of Java programming generating a lot of interesting computer graphics and kind of most most importantly we'll be encoding our math knowledge in software and then we'll be able to reuse it again to solve more difficult problems. Well let's begin with the question why. It helps to understand the college prep gap in spatial math. So if these are the areas where wanting to send our students off well prepared to succeed at. In terms of spatial math at the secondary level, the preparation right now consists of a year of geometry and perhaps a third of the content of a pre-calculus course. And when we ask STEM college professors, where are the students coming in underprepared? These are the answers we get the most often. So 3D sketching and visualization skills are undeveloped. In linear algebra, the students are underprepared in vector math essentials. The same applies to engineering. Uh, some engineering students hit the wall with the math and uh, unfortunately a trit out of their engineering major is a result. And then computer science professors additionally want their students to come in with more experience being able to prove the correctness of algorithms they design. So in order to address this gap, our team developed a one-year capstone course in advanced geometry with computational thinking. We call it algorithmic geometry. And so the fundamental ideas in the course are as follows. So what we'll do is wean the students off of scalar representations and introduce them to using vector representations. What do we mean by that? Well, for example, when we start into 3D geometry, we need a way to represent locations in space. And so students will be introduced to this approach where we formalize the concept of 3D location and use a, a reference object called a VEC3. Students will actually do their own programming for this and it houses or glues together X, Y, and Z scalar numbers. And this object will become very useful shortly thereafter when we challenge the student to be able to represent a sphere. So instead of taking the old-fashioned approach where they represent a sphere using four scalars x y z and r they'll adopt this approach where they'll reuse their vec3 object to represent the center location and just the one scalar for the radius so that's what we mean by vector representations it's not a difficult concept and our students uh, put up absolutely no resistance. In fact, they, they think this approach is, is elegant in terms of simplifying the way they represent locations in space. Now, the other aspect of the course that's fundamental is inventive sketching. So we give very difficult problems, um, more difficult than you can just sit there and think and, and have the lines of code kind of flow out to your fingertips. So rather than that, the students are going to have to become well-versed at exploratory sketching. Uh, sometimes we'll do this collaboratively. Sometimes they'll do it individually. 
and in the extreme of collaboration we'll work on what we call communal sketching where we have one sketch up on the whiteboard and students come up one at a time and add one increment of information to the sketch until the whole problem has been solved. Now the importance of the sketching the way we're using is it, it is when it's done the sketch serves as a specification for a Java numerical algorithm. And so students will look at their sketch and be able to translate it into code and once they've finished that coding they'll want to test it and so they'll also have learned how to write uh, Java, Java, Java graphics code to actually test on the screen whether their um, geometry algorithm is working correctly just by looking at it. So over the course of a one year or 145 hour course students are going to be thrown approximately 200 problems that they're obliged to solve algorithmically. The first semester is all 2D problems, second semester is all 3D. And of course they're going to reuse code prodigiously and so as their library of objects and vector-based methods grows they're going to be able to explore some interesting 21st century apps. So for instance 3D rendering our students will write their own wireframe rendering engine. Um, they'll work with robotics we have a, actually a mechanical shoulder elbow robot arm where <clears throat> we bring in and students learn motor coordination. We look into the topic of GPS positioning actually going back 50 years to the Apollo project and learning how the same algorithms that underlie today's GPS were used to navigate the Apollo missions to the moon. Uh, we'll look into <clears throat> Google street side mapping, do some molecular modeling with graphics, and we even do an interstellar navigation project which is looking into the future, the first mission to Alpha Centauri, and what students will realize after having solved that problem is that the same algorithms that are relevant to interstellar navigation actually work great for mobile robotics with cameras. And then finally we incorporate public speaking as a core competence required of all creative tech people. So looking at all this one-year course if we want to boil it down into two key areas of preparation for STEM college, those would be creative applied math problem solving and vector math implemented in software. And the thinking here is that this is such a pervasive gap that what we might actually be able to justify is a new standard course at the high school level and of course anticipating that the students coming up from middle school in future years will be much more proficient computationally, they'll be more comfortable with writing software. And so the idea is we could develop a standard course that meets the demand for um, advanced spatial math using those computational skills. I can give you a brief project history so the project grew up in the suburbs of Silicon Valley and we did two years of successive piloting in a public school called Doherty Valley High School in San Ramon, California. Roughly equal numbers of boys and girls. We got started with a small grant from Lawrence Livermore Labs and we did have to apply to University of California to vet our course uh, we eventually got a C advanced mathematics designation. Uh, it took three tries and uh, apparently it was initially difficult to explain to the reviewers what a lab was. And we suspect that um, you know those reviewers weren't familiar with computational mathematics. Um, but they finally got it. So, so we were happy to get our designation. Um, which counts towards the mathematics uh, study requirement for University of California admission. 
And then finally, we developed our own assessments. Um, there not being any off-the-shelf assessment that matches up with the type of content we developed for the course. Now, the course is steeped in project-based learning. And so I thought a good way to impart you know, a lot of the essentials and the, the basic methodology of problem solving would be to take apart one of the projects we give. So it's called Plane Down. And if you remember back about seven or eight years um, to Air France 447, a flight was lost in the Atlantic Ocean. And so the challenge for the students is going to be to locate the starting point for search and rescue. So what information do we give the students? Well, the following four pieces of information are given. So these are the geo coordinates for the Rio airport. The destination it never got to was Paris. And these are the geo coordinates for the destination airport. And then additionally, we'll tell them the flight was scheduled to take 11.1 .1 hours However, radio contact was lost 4.2 hours into the flight. So those are the four pieces of information students are given to work with. And so there's an implied task here to not only figure out the flight path, which is, is going to be a great circle route, but then having done that, to interpolate proportionally along that path. Okay, so I said sketching was a key part of the methodology, so we'll take a look here at a student's uh, solution sketch. The sketch provides the specification for the Java code, so we'll, go, we'll take a little look at the student's Java. And then when the code runs, it generates 3D graphics. And kind of this is the key to understanding how the student solved the problem. But let's start over on the left side. So let's look at the sketch first. Um, the first thing you'll notice is how neat it is. So we do impart to our students specific drafting skills, if you will. Um, we're attempting to raise their standard of sketching up to an inventor sketching level. And uh, so just being able to use all the appropriate tools, straight edge for straight lines, uh, 90, 90 degree corners, using a compass for circles, etc., etc. But as far as the math goes, what I would do is direct your attention first to these arrows that are popping out of the center of the Earth. So what are those arrows? Well, those are one of the new things in spatial math um, in the last 30 years. They're called direction vectors. And if you want to think of them numerically, they're essentially points on the unit sphere. So they do represent directions in 3D space using three numbers um, <clears throat> as an alternative to the more traditional pair of angles, phi and theta, or latitude, longitude. Now, What's important is those are the jumping off point in solving the problem. So the first thing the student's trying to do is to take those latitude and longitudes, which were the givens, and get to locations in 3D Cartesian coordinates for the two cities, Rio and Paris. So let's take a look at the code now. So what we'll see over here is that the first two lines of code are taking the latitude and longitude and converting those to a 3D direction vector. This object we're calling a DIRVEC3. And so there's one for the arrow pointing to Rio and one for it pointing to Paris. And I'll just say at this point that the benefit of direction vectors with computation is enormous. Um, People who attempt to solve a problem like this just using the um, polar angles or spherical angles as their primary representation will be dealing with a lot of exceptions, uh, singularities, uh, discontinuities. So um, the reason we teach direction vectors 
is that we avoid almost all those exceptions with this representation. So then, having computed those two directions from the center of the Earth out to Rio and to Paris, the student's in a position to calculate the actual 3D locations for the two airports in a geocentric coordinate system. And that's being done right here. So you see, remember that position, position representing object, the VEC3? Well, here we go with the first one, P Rio is the location of Rio de Janeiro and that can be obtained just by scalar multiplying the direction by the radius of the Earth. I think they're using a 1 to 1000 scale model here so that's why why this looks the way it does. Same for Paris. And then having computed that, student is ready to put some graphics up on the screen and so they'll create an Earth which is just a sphere and they'll create some mini spheres for Rio and Paris. So if we go over and look at the graphics, there's an example. There's the mini sphere for Paris. The, um, the one for Rio is concealed inside this sphere. I'll explain why in a little bit. Okay, so the next step is the student is going to create the great circle route. So you'll notice here using a type of object called a circle 3D and this object would have been developed in the course by the student prior to taking on this lab and it's a general purpose 3D circle so it can be tilted and students will understand how to use direction vector to represent the tilt of the circle 3D and so, um, so the, they're just computing it here in the first line of code. It looks like they're using a cross product of the <clears throat> two direction vectors for Paris and Rio as, as a way to get the orientation of the circle. And then they're going to add that to the content model. And when they do that and they run it, voila, they get their great circle root, which passes through Paris and even though you can't see it here, it's inside the sphere, passes through Rio. So then the question arises, how does the student solve for this crash location? So if we go to the student sketch, we can see how the thinking went on this. So it looks like over on the right, we've got pseudocode or, you know, math expressions. And it looks like what the student started out with is just they know that they can obtain this angle or the cosine of this angle by just taking the dot product of the two directions to the two airports. And from that they can obtain the angle, which they're calling um, theta, or two theta, I guess. And where, where the student's trying to get to is to calculate this straight line distance between Rio and where the crash occurred. And they use some trigonometry of arcs to figure out that maths over here. This wasn't something we taught in our course, but we're kind of building off of what the student learned in their trig. And if you look at the graphics, you begin to understand how the student put this all together to solve for the crash location. So we teach the students a technique called bubbling out or inflating a sphere. So th what that means is if you know a location and you know a distance going out from that location, you can generate a sphere from that information. Well, what the student's done is, is having figured out where the Rio airport is and that exact straight line distance to where the crash occurred is able to construct a sphere with that same radius and location We'll call this the crash sphere. And so the student's logic is that the crash must have taken place somewhere on the sphere. And the student also knows from the previous algorithms that they've solved in the course that they can solve for the intersection of a sphere and a 3D circle. The great circle root is a 3D circle. The crash sphere is a sphere. And so 
the intersection will be two points, this one here and then one going the other way away from Paris. And so using that logic, they can disambiguate and know that this intersection point is what they'll use as the crash location. And this problem solving approach where you opportunistically reuse algorithms you've solved in the past um, constitutes a great deal of the power of algorithmic geometry. When you think about it, you've got, you know, 100 to 200 algorithmic problems already solved and they're sitting there at the ready each and every day to help you solve the next problem. And we find that students don't have any problem at all remembering and utilizing their past algorithmic achievements. And this reuse of results that are stored in algorithms is, is what makes 21st century math really different from 20th century math. There's no corresponding pattern of feed-forward reuse of results in, in traditional geometry. So our team are fairly serious educational researchers and having put all the time into designing this course, going out and teaching it, we felt it would be somewhat pointless to do that unless we also developed um, an assessment whereby we could measure how well we were doing. And part of that philosophy is that if you cannot apply your math thinking in a novel situation, then it's dubious whether you've learned any math at all. So what we did was to design our final exam to test students on a 3D problem that they'd never seen before. So we kept this problem very carefully concealed so as to retain its novelty on the final exam. And so the problem is as follows. So you're asked to design an algorithm to solve the following general problem. So given an extended line, L in 3D, and a point P, solve for the point P sub L closest to P on line L. And so if you'll notice, a design data sheet is required, so that including a sketch. Um, there's reasonably no hope of getting the correct numerical answer without an algorithm and there's no hope of getting an algorithm without a sketch. So that's why we ask for the sketch. It's also to help us debug and see where students fell down. Um, and then the, they have to, after they've, uh, co they've sketched their way to a solution, they've coded it into a numerical algorithm, uh, run it graphically to make sure it looks right on the screen, then they're ready to plug in a test case. So here's the line passes through these two given points and point P is at these coordinates. And so students then crank out the numeric solution to P sub L. So how did students do on this exam problem? Well, this graph summarizes two years of aggregate data collected from n equals 28 students. And it's essentially a pass-fail type of proposition. So you either got to the finish line and got the correct numeric solution to the test case or, or you didn't get anything. And, um, and so out of those 28 students, 21 or three quarters got to the finish line with the correct numeric solution. Now, those are fairly good results for a new pilot course uh, with this sweeping change. The, um, and we did look at the seven students who didn't make it to the finish line and all seven fell down on the sketch. So they never got to the coding phase. And so one of the conclusions that comes out of this preliminary pilot study, and I, we admit it's based on a fairly small smattering of students, um, was that uh, it is harder to teach the inductive, exploratory, uh, inventive sketching techniques uh, than it is to teach the Java coding skills.
But what we can also conclude here is that we, we did establish initial feasibility for this kind of 21st century approach to spatial math with computation. Okay, let's take a look at the graphics workspace. So this is actually a Java application the student is responsible for running. And you'll see what the student's done here is developed some mouse editable circles so they can be dragged around, they can be re resized with the mouse pulling on the circumference. And at this stage in the course, students have just solved the intersection of two overlapping circles. And you'll notice that they highlight the numeric results coming out of their algorithm with two small circles, or we'll call them mini circles, to indicate where the intersections take place. And so what I'd say is a problem like this to, with an intersection of two circles is really off the table in traditional analytical geometry. Um, you run into a problem called the square root problem where you have an expanding uh, term that you have to take the square root of. Interestingly, in computational geometry, you don't have that problem because when the algorithm is running, it's always with hard numbers as input. So any square root can be immediately crunched into a result. And, uh, and, and so students essentially make the jump to solving this kind of problem through applying coordinate translations and coordinate rotations in 2D. That, that allows them to simplify the problem into a special case that they can solve with traditional algebra. They implement it in code and then write the graphics test code. And students very much like this way of testing their work. Um, they don't mind at all being evaluated objectively by the graphics, telling them whether their, their work product is correct or not. And they much prefer to having uh, an educator evaluating the quality of their work. Just more objective. Now here's another PowerPoint like graphical widget students develop. This is called the mouse editable tilted rectangle. And the students ge are generating all the graphics and the mouse handlers for this. So they can drag it by the center, they can reshape by tugging on an edge. Or the third edit is they can edit the orientation by dragging on a rotation handle is seen here. And so this is a great test bed for students to apply what they've learned about their coordinate translation and coordinate rotation theory. So that was the 2D workspace. So let's take a look at the 3D workspace. This is a completely different thing. And how I would explain it is uh, it's a moving viewer navigator. 3D Navigator. So you'll notice down on the bottom left there are three sliders that move the viewer around in X, Y, and Z. There's also a checkbox that toggles back and forth between wireframe and solid surface rendering with a light source. So you see here when Y increases I move back, go behind the house, increase Y, I come back in front. Z, I move myself up, I move myself down. So it's a pretty intuitive navigator. There's one other feature that's used in it, and that's at the center of the screen, you'll see a little cursor there. It's called a focus of attention cursor. And so when you want to zero in attention on a specific area of 3D space, you just drag the cursor to that location and move move the viewer around, the viewer will stay looking at that point. So for instance, now if we want to go up and look at this problem, three overlapping spheres, you can use the cursor. And 
um, I'll just say parenthetically that um, the problem solution we're seeing here is introduced as a recreation of the Apollo M Mission to the Moon Navigation Challenge. <clears throat> so students are reenacting that challenge um, starting with the Deep Space Network, which consists of three telemetry receivers at, at different points around the globe. Those correspond to the three centers of the spheres. The radii of the spheres correspond to the telemetry distances as measured from the Apollo. And the solution to Apollo's whereabouts is the intersection point. There are two of them. One will not make sense because it goes off in the other direction from away from the moon. So we spend a great deal of time working in this 3D workspace. It is one of the best interactive 3D workspaces available in education at this time. And this is our website, algogeom.org. If you're interested in finding out more about algorithmic geometry, this has got a lot of information. If you go to the Educators tab, and you'll see over on the right side an increasing list of downloadables. So, for instance, uh, you could take a look at our robot arm motor coordination project. That's a little movie, the second item. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about how the math foundation is shifting as a result of computation, I'd recommend either my Nashville talk, which is a, an, in a movie format, a movie lecture. It's about an hour long goes into quite a bit of detail. Or if you prefer to read it, there's a approximately 30 page white paper right here on algorithmic geometry. And both go deep into the changing math foundation. It's interesting, most math teachers wouldn't suspect that computation has changed the concepts that are important to know, but um, it certainly has. And that's partly because the arithmetic can all be relegated to the software, so we can afford to work with computations that involve more number crunching than you would ever tolerate for paper and pencil. And that's kind of one of the reasons why direction vectors have supplanted angles for representing spatial direction. Now, if you're interested in the educational research, I would strongly recommend you Go to our Researchers tab, and there you will find a write-up of the summary of the two years uh, of results we got here in the public school in Silicon Valley. And this is our textbook, Flexing the Power of Algorithmic Geometry. So, this is our big, hairy, audacious goal, and that's to modernize college prep spatial math for the 21st century by teaching inventive sketching techniques that double as specifications for software algorithms, uh, helping students choose the best representations for ease of thinking and writing algorithms, and finally to turn math class into a design lab where we're nurturing young inventors. Yes, it's a very ambitious project, but think about it. 21st century math with computational thinking offers the opportunity to completely turn around our mediocre proficiencies compared to the global average. What we have the potential to do here is to move our students to the front of the pack at the collegiate level in their spatial problem solving capabilities not only in their thinking and inventive capabilities, but they'll be able to write really good looking 3D graphic simulators whenever a problem beckons that kind of approach. So if you're interested in pursuing this kind of learning with your students, we seriously encourage you to get in touch with the project. My information is on the following page and thank you very much for listening today. We look forward to hearing from you.